Great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who has been signing into this wonderful conference arranged by the African Union for Housing Finance. This session brings expert speakers to talk about unlocking innovations and investments in sustainable green housing. In 2015, a collective commitment by the world's government to combat climate change led to United Nations Paris Agreement to pursue preventing global temperature rise. The Paris Agreement provides an ambitious roadmap if commitment, policies, and actions can deliver a 7% greenhouse gas emission reduction every year between 2020 and 2030. Global warming can be limited to 1.5 degrees centigrade, preventing the most catastrophic effects of climate change. To reach these energy and climate goals by 2030, around 180 billion euros and additional yearly funding will be needed. Policymakers, financial institutions, businesses, and investors share a collective responsibility in driving these efforts. Climate change, similar to the challenges that we face with current coronavirus pandemic, wouldn't differentiate people based on their passports, their nationalities, or the color of their screen, skin. It will affect all but the most vulnerable at the most. To discuss the, the agenda and its direct impact on various elements of housing and shelter, we have got a distinguished group of speakers joining us today. We have got Mr. Besim Nebu, who is joining us and is the director for the Central and Eastern Europe Habitat for Humanity International. He has been involved in various energy projects within the region and will be sharing his experience and some guidance as we try to explore solutions for Africa. In addition to Besson, we have also got Jane Otema, who is our regional lead for Africa at the Tur Villager Center for Innovation and Shelter, the private sector arm of Habitat for Humanity that works on designing solutions which are sustainable and scalable in nature. Thank you, Besson and Jane, for joining us today. So, Jane, I'll be starting with you first and would love to hear some of your initial thoughts around the impact of climate the potential aspirations, and how do you see it evolving across Africa? Thank you so much, uh, Naeem. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to share our thoughts uh, in this, in this uh, summit, and uh, just to share our thoughts around the contribution of housing to climate action. At the Williger Center for Innovation in Shelters, we work with the private sector to stimulate investments in, in housing. We are very aware that uh, green and sustainable housing has to be part of the conversation. We anchor our thoughts in uh, SDG 13, uh, that's looking at climate action and uh, really reinforcing the fact that urgent action is needed now to combat uh, climate change. We believe that focusing on sustainable housing now, and especially because housing being a highly extractive industry in terms of environment, the materials that are required <clears throat> for construction, um, there is need to focus now on ensuring that materials continue to be green, start to be green, and that we catalyze and unlock investment in efforts that uh, will ensure that we have these green materials and investment. Um, and especially in Africa, as our population continues to grow, we know that the housing need is also going to grow exponentially. Hence, the reason why focusing green, focusing on sustainable technologies, focusing on sustainable housing um, is going uh, to be important. And we also anchor our thoughts on um, making sure that we contribute to other SDGs, for instance, SDG 8, uh, where we see that uh, uh, decent work and economic growth and creating economic opportunities, innovating around uh, housing solutions is going to uh, contribute to that. We are also looking at uh, SDG 9, where we know that um, uh, stimulating industry innovation and uh, infrastructure and ensuring that uh, investments um, continue in the housing space and especially seeing as it were that over half of the world's population is now living in cities, we actually need to start focusing on sustainable and 
green housing solutions for these cities, again contributing to sustainable cities and communities under SDG 11, uh, making sure that cities and human settlements continue to be inclusive, safe and uh, resilient. This in a way speaks to the way we have to begin thinking about how we build and how we utilize our existing built spaces and also just uh, leveraging um, housing to contribute to responsible uh, consumption and production. Uh, this is where we are looking at SDG 12 under responsible consumption and production. How do we recycle um, the, the waste that is currently being churned out by cities and people and making sure that that contributes to sustainable housing. This is why as the Tewilige Center we have, excuse me, this is why as the Tewilige Center we have been focusing our efforts on supporting innovators who are beginning to recycle plastic waste and also agricultural waste for, for housing. Mute, uh, one of the most common themes that we have come across uh, in this COVID situation and working from home. Uh, thank you, Jane, uh, for sharing uh, some light onto where does the climate sits into the the SDG goals and and how how much it has a cross cutting theme when it comes to housing. Besem, uh, continuing from where what Jane shared, uh, we would love to hear from you on. What are some of the projects uh, that you have been working on, which links directly to energy, and uh, and and how do you think that the role it plays, not just from the sustainability of the the immediate outcome, but also some of the cross-cutting themes that goes just beyond the brick and mortar model of a shelter. Thank you, Unaim and Jane. In the geography of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we as Habitat for Humanity have a long-term involvement in the sector of uh, collective residential housing, uh, or as we call it here, multi-apartment buildings. These are blocks usually prefabricated, which were built uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s that house large percentages of population uh, today and in urban areas. Uh, we are talking about uh, 30 to 60 percent of the housing stock in a given country lives uh, under these uh, uh, collective housing units or multi-apartment buildings that are highly in energy inefficient and that spend uh, uh, in an in disproportionate amount of energy uh, in the country. They are also very expensive for the homeowners. Uh, because they consume a lot of energy to heat. You can imagine these are climates where you have, uh, you know, cold, very cold winters and very hot summers, which makes heating and cooling expenses, uh, you know, very high. And there we, we, we enter the topic of uh, what we call energy poverty or fuel poverty uh, of people living in multi-apartment uh, housing sector. And... Uh, <clears throat> That would mean, to translate it in uh, simple terms, uh, in the month of January and February, which are the coldest in, in Europe, that, uh, you know, these uh, vulnerable families would spend as much as 40 or 50 percent of their income just for the heating bill, just to give, to give some uh, context to this. Uh, and then they are, you know, uh, highly unaffordable, but they're also causing high level of emission. I mean, there is a big amount of the emission that comes from the uh, collective uh, housing sector, and that is obviously CO2, uh, but there is also NO particles, SO particles, PM particles, all the other air pollutants that are local. Uh, to sum it up as, a, as habitat, basically we consider the issue of uh, uh, address, addressing it on a systemic way, we would need to find a market solution uh, to renovate this housing stock and bring it to the standard of uh, energy uh, certificates that are uh, ecologically friendly, but also friendly for in terms of consumption of energy. To do so, we have uh, to, to solve several riddles 
if I would call it like this. One riddle is, uh, I mean, we're obviously dealing here with um, homeowners, which are not always the best organized. Uh, the other, so we need to do a lot of community development between the tenants in a collective block, set up systems, ways of them working together, but we also need to find financial instruments because usually the banks will not loan money to uh, a building because they cannot collateralize. And that's, uh, that's uh, you know, we have an imperfection of the financial instruments there. Uh, in addition to an imperfection of the, how the way these communities of homeowners work. In addition, it's usually unaffordable, especially for the lower end uh, uh, of, of the social brackets, let's say consumers who would need some state support in form of subsidy. So we need to combine housing with market or with financial instrument and with a lot of uh, coaching and, and development of community. And that's sort of our approach as Habitat in the uh, residential energy for efficiency for low income houses, or as we call it, Relight project, where we try to do all of these in, the, in an ecosystem of uh, different market actors, state actors, community actors. Uh, we act as a convener and a facilitator, and we actually do demonstration projects where we refurbish some of these blocks in Macedonia, Armenia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then the results of that we try to bring to the market actors and to, to, through advocacy to the policy developers. And here we link with TCIS on the market part and to the habitat advocacy uh, effort in the country on the, on the policy level. Thank you, Bessam. Bessam, there were two, two things that really stood out for me, and I would love Jane to comment on, on that from, from the work that the Terwilliger Center is, is doing uh, in, in some of the, the key countries of the world. One thing is that you talked about, we are referring to trying to influence behavior when it comes to changing the type and the application of construction practices that goes as far as like 50 to 60 years ago. So how do families react, would react to such a change? And so, so Jean, what, it would be great to hear from you. So what are the challenges and, and how do you address the existing paradigms and practices when it comes to housing? Thanks, Naeem. And, and it's, it's very true that as we begin to look at and move towards sustainable and green housing, it becomes very important uh, to address and, and challenge existing paradigms, especially around housing. In, in the African region, housing, and I believe in other regions as well, housing and a home is very aspirational. And, and many people grow up with an image of the kind of home that they would like, and it's always brick and mortar, it's concrete. And so the norms around housing and construction material have been passed on over generations. And coming up with materials that begin to be green uh, needs a lot of acceptance. And it's for this re uh, reason that in this region, part of our programming really is around supporting the identification and addressing of these norms around different We work with homeowners to speak to their aspirations around housing, to speak to their aspirations around a conventional home, but how would that look like if they were to shift and begin to embrace uh, green construction uh, materials. So we also um, address issues around policymakers because some of these norms are really entrenched in our policies and building codes. Um, in some countries, the building codes are as old as independent. 60 years old, but now we are beginning to speak about uh, green housing, which requires the use of different materials and technologies that might not necessarily be enshrined in the building codes. How do we address um, that as we begin to move towards uh, green housing? How do we speak to contractors in, in, in the value chain? Contractors who would rather use specific materials and developers as well, because the offtake at that point then becomes um, quite easy rather than using unconventional as it were green materials that are emerging and then getting stuck with, with the development how 
we speak to that and support these contractors and, and the developers to be able to embrace um, uh, the, the emerging green materials. You also speak to the laborers who in countries like Kenya, we call them fundies. They are trained a certain way. Their norms around construction are entrenched by the training, the education system. And this is around the convention of building materials. But as we begin to think and move green to sustainable investments in housing, then you also have to address the issue of how do we retrain and upskill the, 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 the skills of the laborers and fundies as they are called in some regions, to actually be able to understand how to use effectively these materials. How do we speak to stockists and manufacturers to shift what they see as the quick moving products to begin to embrace um, these uh, materials that are emerging? But most of all also, how do we begin to shift the norms around our young innovators, our young people to begin to actually embrace ideas and bring to bear um, the technologies and innovations around these green materials? And this is the work that the Tewiliga Centre in the region is doing right from when we set up uh, the first shelter tech uh, accelerator in the region and, and working with the young innovators that have come out of that. We have certain uh, fledgling companies, for instance, Corec, uh, we have Dijenge, we have uh, Mysotile, we, we have Manpro, all young innovators that have come up with ideas to either recycle pr plastic into construction materials or recycle agricultural waste into construction materials. And they're beginning to reach a point where they are testing the ideas and wanting to pilot projects. The changing and shifting and addressing of these norms also goes hand in hand with being able to support such young people, such innovators, to actually test and put their ideas out there in the market. Bessem, uh, this takes me to the, to the Rely project, which has been a highlight of some of the energy and climate work that Habitat has done. So it would be very interesting to hear as, as Jane touched base on how the norms impact the homeowners, the policymakers, the contractors, the laborers, the stockists. When we went in with the Rely project in partnership with USAID, what were the, the challenges that, that you saw uh, that you would uh, refer to as the key barriers? And then what were the interventions that were designed to address those barriers to, to move towards a much more energy efficient structure? Well, I think the first uh, barrier is to realize the interdisciplinarity uh, of, of the, or the web of different uh, policy uh, and regulatory frameworks that affect housing, especially in collective housing. Uh, and connected with the energy, because here the, the main issue at hand is the energy performance of the building. Uh, there is uh, the, the energy topic as a policy, and then there is the housing topic as a policy, and they're regulated normally by different agencies and different uh, rules and regulations. And normally those agencies and uh, rules and regulations don't talk to each other. Uh, in an adequate way uh, or do not enable, do not create an enabling situation for intervention in the refurbishment. Uh, not always contradictory, but sometimes they, they, even that would be the case. So unlocking that as a barrier would be the first and also trying to translate the language of uh, energy policy to housing policy would be another uh, area. In addition to a uh, uh, affecting the vulnerable groups living in housing estates, which goes to the social policy agenda. So you see there is a, a aspect of this, which is also part of the environmental policy, because we are dealing with uh, pollution and pollutants and CO2, which goes, uh, you know, into a completely new uh, policy area. So understanding complexities and trying to navigate and convene different uh, uh, stakeholders that speak on behalf of these policy levels and uh, trying to unlock the potential which is in the uh, basically home institutional uh, conundrum of uh, different actors and their agendas uh, would be the uh, first point. And I think Habitat plays an incredible role in that respect as being a stakeholder that convenes all of these. Uh, then uh, I think uh, a major 
problem um, or, or issue would be for us to be uh, doing uh, showing uh, good practices uh, with the market because the market is very hesitant in Eastern Europe or, and I think probably everywhere to do uh, to radically change the way they lend to specific target groups especially you know the commercial banking sector to the target group of uh, uh, homeowners living in a apartment block which is not very well maintained and doesn't have a good history of repayment so engaging the financial sector is a major challenge and showing that this could work and is a viable uh, business uh, and that you know especially tying it with specific state actors to vulnerable groups that is by all means a uh, long-term process but our approach is to do it on a micro level in before we try to scale it and make it a sustainable uh, practice so in certain ways our demonstration projects where we actually do start with specific number of homeowner associations and then lead them through a process of uh, improving building maintenance and uh, practices of self-organization and then uh, uh, finding uh, the right uh, subsidy with the right bank loan or commercial loan and then actually doing the reconstruction we then use as a policy instrument or as an advocacy tool to show that it's doable because I think when and this is where the habitat strength is because if, if people see around that increases demand but also appetite from both politicians and policy uh, uh, representatives but also from the commercial sector so in, a, in other words we, we try to show viability through doing uh, a project and doing it in terms which is not too much artificial in the sense that the subsidy has to be at the right level the the the, the, the financial instrument has to be user friendly or can can have a, a wide uptake and uh, the homeowner association or neighborhood that we engage in those pilots or demonstration projects have to be representative of the community so it doesn't have to be neither too much high you know uh, well prepared or too little well prepared it, sh it should be representative of the wider number of uh, uh, people or the target group living under the, the, that conditions and i think that's where we do a lot of prototyping and modeling and uh, try to cross pollinate between experiences in different countries because as i said there are probably around 300 million uh, territory in terms of population of countries which live in uh, the Central and Eastern Europe and a large percentage of that under the problem that we I just described earlier. Uh, Jane, coming back to Africa here, uh, we talked about some mining uh, investment models which are well understood both at the demand side and the supply side of the value chain. Uh, generally, it has been observed that the moment that we start talking about housing and finance, uh, the inclination is to just look at one single solution, which is more towards mortgage financing. Uh, so, so from your perspective and from the experience of coming across a lot of people within the housing value chain, uh, how do they uh, pursue or how do they see uh, housing as an opportunity for investment in Africa, firstly, and probably then you can touch base on what are some of the challenges that they face, because if housing is is not fully understood and the, the different flavors of housing are not understood, it would be difficult to, to come up and design products which may not fully meet the needs uh, that might be out there for the people to benefit from. Um, thank you, Naeem. Um, the conversation around financing and housing, and especially now as we begin to think about um, sustainable or green housing, can be quite a complex and challenging one in this region. Um, and, and for many governments, for instance, the government of Kenya, where we have the agenda for, and in, which in part uh, pushes the affordable housing uh, discourse, 
it, it does get convoluted both in meaning and application because affordability for most people depends on, on where you are. And, and affordability for some people means that you could get a mortgage, you could get financing and, and be able to uh, afford a house or be able to, to build a house. But the mortgage market in many African countries, and if I could speak for my country, Kenya, is still a very thin and underdeveloped uh, space. In fact, as we speak, we have uh, probably less than uh, 28,000 mortgages uh, for the whole country. But every day, all the time, you look around and people are building in this country. And, and that realization for us in Habitat made us to begin to think perhaps we could work with the private sector to begin to think of other um, other types of financing housing away from mortgage. And, and this is where we've worked um, through a project that we had with MasterCard, uh, we call it the Bauer project. We did build capacity of, of uh, financial uh, service providers, for instance, to come up with housing microfinance. Now microfinance has been known um, for a lot of people to really uh, support enterprise uh, growth and enterprise development. However, we were able to leverage microfinance uh, to begin actually to provide the incremental financing that many households are requiring to be able to finance housing. So ju just supporting the private sector to think differently, for instance, come up with the different um, instruments to finance uh, the, uh, housing for the low-income households has been a step in the right direction for us. But also globally as a program, the TCIS has gone into the uh, blended finance space where for the longest time now, perhaps for the last uh, uh, 10 or so years, uh, we've been having the microbuild uh, fund that, that we've been uh, leveraging to be able to support capitalization for, for different uh, financial institutions to be able to offer finance. Now, this hasn't worked very well in Africa. Obviously, it's worked much better in um, in, in Europe and, and it's because of the hedging factor and the fact that um, we require long-term financing in this region for housing finance to work, uh, we require long-term financing. And the hedging has become um, uh, an expensive aspect in being able to roll out uh, our, our microbuild fund in Africa. However, all is not lost because we continue to continuously uh, innovate and, and, and talking to private sector and talking to different donors and financiers, just asking ourselves, how can we be able to begin to move towards the space where uh, finance and affordable finance for that matter is able to be provided for the households that we are working with. And in Africa where it is honor driven construction, it's incremental housing, it's, it's people need to be able to access money to build incrementally and in that way be able to afford um, houses. And, and just coming back to linking that again to uh, green building materials, which in many ways um, most people consider to be alternative construction materials. How do we even begin to educate the financials, to educate the investors to understand how to finance these alternative construction materials, even if it were energy, because for Africa, again, uh, energy poverty is something that uh, we are having to contend with all the time. How do we actually move towards supporting the development of instruments to be actually uh, be able to support these alternative construction materials, affordable building materials that um, are coming out to support the, the, the greenhouse in space. Thank you, Jane, and that was really insightful. Best time, uh, I would direct the last question to you and then probably would love to hear some concluding remarks from Jane as well. One of the things that, that clearly came out in, in, in both Bessem's and Jane comment here today was the core relationship between finance, uh, material, labor, industry, uh, and the ecosystem. And, and one thing if, if we equate all this together is the concept of job creation. Because as you talked about, even though that the mortgage financing is, is, is at a very nascent stage in majority parts of the developing world and just not Africa, I would rather say, you still see a lot of construction happening you still see a lot of people who belong to the informal salary segment 
still improving their houses. So based on, for, from the Rely project and the energy work that you and Habitat has been leading in the Eastern Europe, how would you touch base around or give or highlight the impact that it has created on employment generation? Because I think that would be one of the most interesting aspects as the development finance institutions look into housing as a sector or an in, as a sector that might be of interest for investments. Uh, the initial inroads into the uh, residential energy issue were uh, where we work with USAID, by the way, the Rely project is uh, sponsored and implemented in cooperation with uh, USAID. We also engage what you would call the supply side in the uh, in the ecosystem, and that's uh, uh, basically uh, home maintenance companies, management companies, construction industry, which includes uh, companies that produce uh, insulation material, for example. Uh, or uh, sell uh, vendors of uh, uh, windows and doors, which are energy efficient, uh, roofing, I mean, just to name a few. The, uh, so obviously there is uh, in, in Europe significant uh, level of offer, uh, which has developed over the decade, over the uh, uh, you know energy efficiency work, but we are uh, trying to create or uh, strengthen the offer which appeals to the to the target groups that we engage uh, in our project and also try to create uh, with uh, within that framework also employment opportunities uh, because believing that uh, you know sort of offer will create demand and affordability uh, in that chain of reaction. So we have, uh, through Habitat Macedonia, for example, developed a curricula of uh, vocational training on energy trades, on energy efficient trades, where there is actually a quite a lot of demand in the country uh, and or, or in the other countries for refurbishment of, uh, of uh, or for building uh, materials, which are uh, using these efficient technologies. And we have uh, managed to uh, make it part of the uh, curricula of vocational training schools in the country. So basically, uh, students that you learn trades of construction, uh, you learn trades of energy efficient renovation and energy efficient building. We have also engaged a number of uh, management and maintenance companies which offers services to residential manage, property management to include energy efficient practices and also energy efficient materials in the construction and renovation of the housing stock. And we have also in certain places also created uh, as Habitat uh, or co-created uh, management companies. Macedonia is one example where we actually try to improve the offer on the market by improving the services via a vendor that we, we support. We also give through TCIS uh, some support to existing market players uh, in order that uh, there is more and better and more higher quality uh, residential materials and services offered in the market. So in that way, we not only work with homeowners as uh, the demand, but uh, and with the, obviously with the commercial uh, financial institutions and, uh, and microfinance institutions, but we also work with other actors in the ecosystem which are on the side of the supply. So I will just put this last question to both you and Jane and Vesem to answer. So in your opinion, if there were the top two things that needs to be done to make housing much more energy inclusive or to start with making housing more uh, housing more inclusive with energy becoming a core component of that what are the top two things that you would recommend to the policymakers or the investors to drive that change jane do you want to go in first Thank you, Naeem. Um, and, and I think right now, more than ever, with the advent of the uh, COVID pandemic, that question becomes uh, quite pertinent. And, and the thoughts I've had around that, 
and also both informed by the recent study that has been done by the Tewiliga Center. And we do have a, a session in the report that will be speaking to the uh, housing as the cornerstone of, of recovery. I would say that if in order for us to make um, efficient energy and, and to begin to focus a lot more on not just efficient energy, but sustainable and green housing that we have to begin to leverage and see the, the multiplier effect of housing and, and that policymakers actually need to bring to be to bring back housing at the core of conversations be it be for economic development uh, be it be for, for for social development housing needs to begin to play uh, the center stage role that it actually deserves because housing in itself has quite a big uh, multiplier effect, uh, both for employment, both for consumption, uh, looking at health dividends, looking at education dividends, looking um, at incomes and livelihoods. And, and I do believe that if we uh, got to move our policymakers to actually put housing at the center stage, and then begin to think sustainable, begin to think of how housing is actually being used to leverage uh, different aspects and develop the economy, that we are going to actually gravitate towards having the conversation around green energy, uh, around uh, renewable energy, around uh, energy investments in, in green energy happening, because investors would need to understand that the risk for them is mitigated, that they will put money where they can get meaningful returns, be it social development or economic returns. And our policymakers need to be at the center stage of making that happen. No, I completely agree with uh, uh, Jane. I think uh, housing needs to be uh, brought at the forefront of the policy consideration which it not not always is i mean uh, addressing uh, residential energy issues usually cannot be done efficiently and effectively through energy policy means you have to have housing policy considerations uh, and uh, housing needs considerations so the housing first approach should be looking at, uh, at the housing aspect of it. Uh, and it not always does. And I think it is our job to, to, to uh, raise this awareness and, uh, you know, across, actually, I think it's a global issue, not just in Africa and in Europe, but everywhere that, and make housing a bigger priority than it is in the policy agendas of governments and international organizations uh, so that uh, you know the multi-sector approach uh, considers uh, actually those who live in the residential housing and their uh, needs and uh, actually priorities prioritizes it over the other aspects i think the second uh, consideration who should be that um, because this was the first one uh, would be that uh, housing creates different policy outcomes you know in terms of health in terms of economic development in terms of improving the environment in and in in terms of uh, improving the livelihoods of uh, people so i think creating uh, uh, an approach which would be housing centered or at least would have the housing lens in it strengthened would lead to better outcomes in every one of these uh, uh, subject matters and topics which kind of seem to be boxed and they shouldn't be that indeed is is very true based on the comments that we heard from Bessem and Jane and some of the findings that have come out from the cornerstone report, which you would be hearing at another session being hosted at the forum. It seems that it is of utmost importance that the international organizations, national and local governments, the private sector, nonprofits should focus on energy efficient and sustainable housing. To do so, they need to start with inclusive housing, making housing a primary stimulus intervention for economic recovery particularly for what is being designed for the COVID-19 pandemic. 
due to its outsized effects on economies and the attending and the health and the social benefits. Make housing visible. Address the large startling data gaps related to housing, which have made it hard to understand the size and importance of the sector, particularly those who represent the informal communities or the informal sector. Design policies right. Policies must ensure maximum economic recovery and equitable distribution of benefit, while also ensuring that the investors are safeguarded and create an enabling environment. Last but not the least, make markets inclusive. Use the COVID-19 response era to build more inclusive housing markets and address various needs of income level, rental home ownership, formal informal sector, and those linked to the housing value chain, either it touches on the material side, the supply side, or the labor side. We thank you all once again for joining us as we forge partnerships to create a world where everyone has a decent place to live in. Thank you so much.